Come on in. Welcome everybody. I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab some food if you haven't started getting that already. We are going to, I'm going to welcome you and get going today because we have a lot to pack in in this first hour here. Um, the food today is provided by Cajun and Creole in Daddy's Kitchen. A reminder that today's event is a zero waste event. So all of your utensils and plates and cups are compostable and so there's places where you can put them and don't put them in the regular trash. And shout out to the city of St. Paul who's gonna collect it and dispose of it. Um, so that's super cool. Uh, my name is Melinda Donaway. I'm the manager of Mid Choices here at Social Services in Ramsey County and I'm very proud to be welcoming you today. Um, we are in for an amazing time to be hearing from these amazing black women behind me today. Um, today is spent is the theme of these events are the power of black women, her victories, vision, and voice. And today is the first of our events focused on our legacy and our future. Before we get going, I want to take a moment of silence to honor Bill Wilson, the first African American elected to the city of St. Paul Council. He recently passed away, as you may know. And so we want to give him a moment of silence to honor his legacy. Okay, so the Black History Committee has for us a, a performance that they're going to perform that sets the tone for today's event. So I, I ask them to come to the floor. Do that now. You may write me down in history with your bitter, sweet, with your bitter, twisted lies. You may try me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I got oil wells pumping in my living room? Just like moons and like suns with a certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still, all right. to the Black History Committee that was Still I Rise by Miss Maya Angelou. And just a, a huge thanks for the time and effort that you put into organizing these events that are so meaningful and so relevant to our work in this community. Um, so I, like I said, the concept of today's panel is uh, our future. I'm sorry, I didn't memorize that from there. <laughs> black women, the power of black women. So I want to introduce Sarah Hawley, who's going to frame the discussion today. Sarah Hawley is the Health and Wellness Service Team Race at Health and e Health Equity Administrator, where she leads the service team in advancing racial and health equity and advises senior leadership on the resources, implications, and strategies to advance race and health equity. Before coming to Ramsey County, Sarah worked at the Minnesota Department of Health for 13 years. She has a bachelor's degree in women's studies from the University of Minnesota and a master's of public health in administration and policy. 
and she is also the radio host of Camel J's 89.9 FM Know Your Options show that provides information and resources to communities most in need. Welcome, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Gotta get some energy in this room, right? It's Black History Month, it's a celebration. What a wonderful poem by um, Dr. Maya Angelou and Still I Rise. So I really wanna, you know, on behalf of the Black History Month Planning Committee, we wanna thank you for being here today. I'm really excited about today's panel. I wanna welcome this beautiful, talented, just inspiring black women to come have a seat. I think I'm going to use the lavalier. There's one right next to Tina. Maria, right at the end. Yeah. Thank you for allowing us some grace to get set up. So again, it's my honor and privilege um, to be the moderator, moderator of today's panel, Powerful Black Women in Leadership here at Ramsey County. Um, theme of today's panel, as Melinda mentioned earlier, is our legacy, our future. And we have seven amazing black women here today um, to share their experience as leaders and how they intend on lifting other women up as a part of our legacy and our future, right? I also want to recognize that there are other amazing, smart, driven, and powerful black women here at Ramsey County that are not on the panel today, right? They're in this room, That's right. they're at their desk working, they're out in the community, and so I just want to lift that up and recognize that. Um, and thank you for your leadership and work and contributions here at Ramsey County, and on behalf of our communities, because we are in public service. We are county employees, so I just want to lift that energy up that while we have seven amazing people here today, that does not um, include everyone that is working here at the county. So without further ado, I want to introduce our panelists, our amazing panelists, and I'll keep saying that today. I'm so excited about this. By the way, I've, I've been at the county since May, right? And so I'm really excited to be a part of the Black History Month Planning Committee and to have this honor to talk with you all today. And so first I want to um, introduce Commissioner Tony Carter, and you can clap by the way. <laughs> these wonderful uh, Commissioner Carter was elected by voters of the District 4 in March of 2005. Commissioner Tony Carter has led on important issues at the local, state, and national level. Commissioner Carter has led several, I mean several, Ramsey County systems change efforts. Prior to her election to Ramsey County Board of Commissioners, Tony Carter served as a member of the chair and chair of the St. Paul Board of Education. She's active in community building for over 30 years. Commissioner Carter has served on numerous community boards. I also want to mention, I cannot fail to mention this, Commissioner Tony Carter is the first African American ever to serve on a county board in Minnesota. Ever. I know. Next, I want to introduce the amazing Tina Curry. You can clap for Tina Curry. <laughs> Tina Curry is the Financial Assistance Service Director at Ramsey County since April 2012. She is responsible for the administration of safety net programs such as homeless shelter services, child care, financial food, and medical assistance so Ramsey County residents can survive and thrive. Before joining Ramsey County, Tina worked at Hennepin County Human Services Public Health Department, or Public Health Department, yes, as a child protection investigator, child protection upfront social worker. She's worked in child protection for a long time, to say that. Um, and she's done amazing work. One of the things that I want to mention about Tina is that she's worked in social service for over 30 years. Ms. Tina Curry. Next, we have Ms. Karen Francois. You can stop. She is the Deputy County Manager of Information and Public Records since May of 2018. Prior to joining Ramsey County, she served as an Assistant Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Employee and Economic Development. Prior to that, she served as the Director of Contract Compliance and Employment Equity Divisions at the 
city of Minneapolis from 2011 to 2016. She also serves on a number of boards and councils that promote entrepreneurship, workforce development, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. Ms. Karen Ryan Squaw. Next, I have Ms. Kathy Hadeen. Yay! <laughs> she is the Interim Public Health Director. Kathy has over 18 years of experience in local government. Again, she's the Interim Director of St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health Department. She leads a department of over 333 skilled, talented, and diverse employees with a budget of over $56 million. She's also a member of the Ramsey County Health and, Human, or Health and Wellness Service Team Leadership Team, as is Tina. Kathy is also a Kresge National Emerging Leader of Public Health, which is amazing. And she serves on, an, on many state and county advisory teams. <coughs> Ms. Kathy Hedy. Ms. Dana Mitchell. <laughs> See, she brought her people today. She brought her people. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Ms. Dana Mitchell is the granddaughter and daughter of a fierce, empathetic black woman. Her grandmother, Timothy Vaughn, Van, Van, Van was a St. Paul civil rights activist. Yes. Her mother was a nurse practitioner and now serves others through her volunteerism. Dana's professional experiences include private law practice, staff attorney for the court appointed monitoring, overseeing the largest civil rights lawsuit in the U.S. history, and she is an assistant Ramsey County attorney where she has served in human services, juvenile prosecution, and civil departments. Dana is also a member of the Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers. Ms. Dana Mitchell. Maria Mitchell. Mitchell. <laughs> Maria is Assistant Ramsey County Attorney in the Treatment Courts and Pretrial Justice Division. Ms. Mitchell previously worked in child protection. Prior to coming to Ramsey County, Maria was employed by the State Public Defender's Office in Hennepin County where she handled serious person, person crimes. Maria is also a member of the Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers and she presently serves as the Chair of the St. Paul Human Rights so, Maria. Last but not least, <laughs> the newest person to leadership here, maybe even on the panel, Ms. Deanna Pesic. <laughs> Deanna is the newly appointed Chief Compliance and Ethics Officer for Ramsey County. In this role, she heads a new office responsible for designing and implementing a centralized compliance and ethics program for the organization of more than 3,800 3, employees. Deanna has worked internationally, right? You lived in China? Singapore. Singapore for 11 years. Um, and she has worked for more than 15 years in compliance, most recently as the Senior Vice President Anti-Financial Crimes at Deutsche Bank and Global Anti-Corruption, I didn't want to mess that up, Council and the Volvo Group. She's an amazing person. And welcome to Ramsey County. It's Deanna <laughs> So we're going to share this mic, I think. So I'm going to hand this on. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right. So the first question. So again, the theme of today is our legacy, our future, right? And so we really want to have these amazing women talk about um, who they are as leaders, <laughs> what mark they want to leave, right, in society for our future. And so my first question for the group would be, what were some of the most important experiences that helped prepare you for your leadership role? First of all, thanks for being here. I expected five people. <laughs> <laughs> so this is overwhelming and in a really good way. So the theme was really about looking back and looking forward. And so when I look back, foundationally, it's really about my mom and my grandmothers. They're everything. They, they taught me everything. So my grandmother was a single parent of 10 kids who was raised in the South and brought 10 babies to St. Paul knowing no one and made a life for herself, but she made a life for other people as well. And she started Model Cities from nothing 
and I think Melinda acknowledged that, oh, I knew your grandmother. She created opportunities for people, and she looked at it from a really large perspective, and my mom looked at it from the interpersonal perspective. How do I heal people one person at a time? And that was so powerful to me. And what they taught me was that you show up, you work hard, and you stand up for what you think is right always. And that was so instrumental. And looking forward, it's about my daughter, Bella. She's watching me. She's watching me all the time. So it's up to me to show her what it means to be strong, to be vulnerable, to ask questions, to be curious, and to bring people with me. I always tell her, if it's good for you, it's good for somebody else. So bring somebody else with you. It's not a one-person show, it can't be. So those are the personal experiences I've had. But the professional experiences really started in Hennepin County. And I remember being a, a law clerk, and I just got off uh, clerking for the White House, and I, I thought I was pretty slick. And I'm like, I, I clerked for the president. And so I'm starting at, at Hennepin County, and there was this really big case involving a black woman who was a, a victim of a pretty serious sexual assault. She happened to be a, a prostitute. And the prosecutor said, well, she's just a black prostitute. Who's going to care? And I said, I do. I care. And I battled her. And I'm a first-year law student. And she really wanted to put her thumb on me, and I wasn't having it. I'm Timothy Vann's granddaughter. I'm not having it. <laughs> and I had, I had William McGee in my corner. And he talked to me about character. He said, people are going to be in charge of your reputation, but you're in charge of your character. <coughs> and I've never forgotten that. So for me, it's all about character. What is my character? I get to define that. But I also make sure that I bring people with me. I show good work, my good work, but I show other people's good work. Thank you. Let's mix it up. Let's go to Ms. Curry. Mm. Good afternoon. First, I want to thank the Black History Committee for inviting me to participate on this panel. It's an honor and pleasure to be among such dynamic African-American women leaders. As I reflected on the experiences that I've influenced my leadership journey the most, I realized that my experience could be grouped into three categories, people, situations, and the personal. People who have been particularly influential in shaping my leadership journey include my mother, as Dana also mentioned, um, a former supervisor, Patrice Hughes Alford from Hennepin County, and life coach Kazua Zhang. Due to my parents divorcing when I was five years old, my three sisters and I were raised by my mother. My mom was an amazing woman. She worked hard to provide for us. And she also instilled in us the value of a good education. She was instrumental in guiding me to go on and continue my education, so I got that advanced degree. And she also encouraged and supported me along the journey. A former supervisor, Patrice Hughes Alford, provided me my first opportunity to serve as a social worker, and then she gave me my first social worker unit supervisor position. Both positions gave me unique opportunities to develop and utilize my skills to serve families in the child welfare system. A particularly unique component of the supervisory position was that it allowed me to manage the planning and supervision of the first children's developmental out of home placement unit for children in Hennepin County. Patrice recognized that my organization and leadership skills early on and gave me that platform to shine. Every, every aspiring <coughs> leader of color needs a Patrice, or I should say Patrick, in their corner. For the personal inspiration, Kazua Zhang was a leadership coach I worked with when I attended St. Catherine's Leadership Institute Women of Color cohort. A fond memory that I have 
with her as recalling the morning I informed her that I was leaving Hennepin County to pursue a management opportunity with Ramsey County Children and Family Services. I was elated and I was just saying, oh, Kajua, I'm going to Ramsey County, you know, and Kajua just quietly said to me, oh, that's a good career move, but what next? It left me a little puzzled and I felt a little deflated. But then she, she just said to me, it's good, Tina, but you need to remember that this isn't permanent. You need to always think about it as it's preparing you for your next move. She was right, and I'm thankful to have been equipped with that advice early in my career. Collectively, these experiences have prepared me for leadership. My sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated. I seen a hand go up back there. <laughs> hey, <laughs> is there another Delta in the house? <laughs> uh, has a program, Delta Gyms, that is for adolescent young women. The program provides activities that are centered around leadership, community outreach, public service, cultural wellness, uh, public image building, and also just building confidence and respect respectful young ladies to strive to prepare them for taking active roles in leadership and public service. My goal is to become more involved with them this year. Currently, I'm on the membership development and the literary luncheon committee, so my focus this year will be actively engaging with them. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. All right, Ms. Karen Francois. Hey. Um, so one of the things that uh, Sarah uh, didn't mention is that at this moment in time, since yesterday, since our county manager went um, on vacation, oh, right. yeah. I am <laughs> the acting county manager, the first black female acting county manager. You're the second person who's asked me for a raise. <laughs> Deanna. Um, <laughs> so, and, and, I, and I just said in Ramsey County, but actually it's in the state of Minnesota, because trust me, there are no other uh, deputy county managers or county managers in Minnesota who are black women. So I'm very proud. Um, of that. And I'm also very proud and honored and actually humbled by being on this, uh, being seated with these wonderful women at this table with me um, today. Um, I also, I want to thank Sarah, because Sarah has really stepped up to pull this panel together. It kind of was a last minute kind of thing, and you have really done an amazing job pulling us together. And she sent us the most beautiful email of what this morning or last night. last night um just encouraging us and it was just amazing so i just want to thank her so much um for doing that i also want to uh just take a second to talk about what leadership is and what leadership isn't leadership is not a title you don't have to have a dcm or a cm or a director or a manager or even a commissioner in your in, uh, next to your name uh, to say that you're a leader. Um, as Sarah said, there are a lot of black women who are not sitting at this table and you're out there and you're leading every single day because you are creating opportunities for other people to shine. That's what leadership is about, creating those opportunities so other people can be leaders. And that's what I have tried to do throughout my career. And that's what I will continue to do. The most important experiences that I've had to bring me to this place where I actually do have a, a DCM and an ACM in my title um, is about relationships. It's about building relationships. It's about taking risks, putting yourself out there so that you are available for opportunities. Continue to do that continue to be available. There are opportunities, and that's what I've done. I've made myself available. I've stood up and, and made myself uh, people aware of me when it wasn't comfortable for me. Um, a lot of people who know me won't believe this, but I'm, I'm shy. I, <laughs> I, I, I know you don't. I, 
I'm an introvert, I'm shy, but when it comes to um, being a role model and advancing, I will put myself out there um, when it, it may not be very comfortable for me. So I am going to continue to mentor um, women of color, black women, um, so that we will be able to level the playing field. I don't want to be the last, I, I, I don't mind being the first, but I don't want to be the last acting county manager or count, there's a county manager out there and I'm looking <coughs> at you, you know, so make yourself available, create those relationships, develop those relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So let's pass it down to Deanna. Oh, yeah. oh no. <laughs> That's just me getting out of uh, talking next, actually. So yeah, I, I, I pass it over to Mr. Carter. I, I am. I am also. I think, as Karen said, a bit introverted, and people might find that hard to believe as well. Um, and I, I'm a little. It's a little surreal for me because um, you know, not too long ago, uh, just about two years ago, I was sitting in Singapore <coughs> trying to decide if I was going to come back to the U.S. after being abroad for 11 years uh, with two children who are seven and um, wondering, you know, what kind of country I was bringing them back to, first of all. I mean, let's be honest. And, you know, one's a boy, one's a girl, twin, and, you know, just trying to decide, is this really where we want to go with these two children at this stage <coughs> of their life? Um, we did make that decision. We came here. We're not from Minnesota, so it's new to both of us. And, you know, leaving what was really a, a promising, you know, career trajectory overseas. And I think, for me, um, that was, you know, there's a, there's a lot I can say about, um, you know, what, what uh, leadership, um, it, what experiences affected how I see leadership and, and what brought me here. Um, there were two areas, mentoring, and you know, in like probably everyone here, starting with a very strong female role model, uh, my grandmother, uh, and with uh, you know, with my father, who gave me you know both both um, them, my mother gave me a very solid uh, ethical moral um, compass, and you know, the ethics part of my um, title I take extremely seriously. And it's, it, it's, it comes from, you know, a very firm foundation from them. But, you know, I, I also had the, the, for, the, the great um, fortune to have some very strong mentors as well in my uh, education. Um, a gentleman named uh, James Walton, who passed away very recently, so it's, you know, it's very difficult. He um, was the head of the English department <coughs> at Fresno State University and had a extremely um, huge shadow that he cast over many of us, and we were very fortunate to have him. And, you know, really, really sort of um, gave us uh, a, a firm understanding of what it meant to be uh, people of color, um, not just African American, but we, we had, um, you know, in our little group, our, we had Vietnamese, Hmong, um, Mexican American, uh, Japanese American woman. It was, you know, very broad but deep group of people being influenced by him. And I think um, on the the professional side, I'd have to say living abroad was really um, probably the the big game changer for me because I got to walk into rooms where not only was I the only uh, black woman. Uh, sometimes I was the only woman, and sometimes um, I was the only American uh, in Korea, in India, Malaysia, Indonesia, <coughs> in cultures that were very um, inhospitable to women. And so I found myself having to approach situations, very difficult situations, but without the weight of being a black woman. And that's what I, what really, I think, changed my mindset uh, in terms of being able to go out in the world and walk into these professional settings and have people look at me first as an executive, second as a Westerner, um, third as someone who could shift the ground from under them, you know, d depending on how things might work out. And then, only then, would they maybe ask me about what it's like to be an African-American woman, and mostly because 
you know, there was Obama here, there was Michelle Obama, there was the president. They were very interested in how things were being affected in the U.S. And, but they were not focused on my race. And it allowed me the freedom to move without that weight uh, of having to shift that weight every time I walked into a room to demonstrate my ability to have to, uh, have to really uh, almost force people to accept the fact that I have a role that might have some authority. Um, and it's something I'll probably have to get used to being back in the US, but it was, it was free and it definitely allowed me the ability to grow in a way that I don't think I would have here. If I had the opportunity to get in front of uh, young black women, I would say, leave the country for a while. Go somewhere where you can be yourself, where you can demonstrate who you are based on who you are and not what you are. Give yourself an opportunity, just get a passport and, and buy a ticket. That's what I told a young man a couple of weeks ago. Buy a ticket, pick any place. Don't sit there and plan it for months, just go. You can come back, you can do it all over again if you don't like that experience. But I think um, I would strongly encourage uh, young and older women to do the same thing. Um, and I would also, you know, as a new person in back in the U.S. and in this community, uh, I think I'll try everything that I can to get in as many organizations and, and FaceTime as I can because I know that representation means everything. You have to see yourself somewhere sometimes before you can see yourself there, right? And so I'd like to get my, I'd like to get in front of as many groups as I can, not to promote myself, but to promote the idea that I might be someone's reflection and that might help them get the courage to do something they thought they couldn't do. Thank you. Dave. The same things Dr. Walton did for me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to pass this to Commissioner Carter. Now, whatever your respectful time you have, these are amazing, and you have amazing experiences. So I just want to highlight everything that going on in this group and the amazing work that you all are doing. And Commissioner Carter, can you speak to that first question also? <coughs> yes, it will. And thank you so much. It's a, a, just a pleasure to be here. I know I can't say a, lo a lot of things, <laughs> but I do want to make sure that you know this is a wonderful opportunity for us all to join together around a reflection on the history of African Americans, but actually around a reflection that we really are all one. I consider you all my family. You know, there is a poem that I published in a book a long time ago. My sister wrote it. But bear with me just for a minute. It is really about the black family. As I share it with you, I just want you to know that we are all that family. It's been hidden from us for some time that we really all do come from that same area. And that is the continent of Africa. And you know, except for the fact that we look a little different, we are all of the same race, and that is the human race. So, eternity embraces the black family. Its members are all grand. Eternity embraces the black family. Dear Lord, you have helped us to stand. Against all that has tried to divide us, you've continued to protect and to guide us. From the stories once told by the drums to the spirituals continually sung, our histories preserved and made whole for the most powerful roots in history are those that anchor the black family tree. Just wanted to start out with that, because it anchors my soul. And to thank all of you. I want you to know I haven't always lived here in Minnesota. I come from Alabama, from a small town in Alabama called Bessemer, where one set of grand folks lived, and from another rural area in Alabama called Adamsville, where another set of grand folks lived. And that, by the way, happened to be the name of the plantation owners in my family's history. My family certainly descends from that tradition in America of slavery, but they were not slaves. They were captives. I do want to share that I have a tradition and a legacy of strength, of courage, of ambition, a legacy of excellence and self-determination. You know, my family were coal miners in the South. 
some were ore miners. My mother was a tray passer at a hospital, and my father was a mechanic. I and my sister never knew that we were poor, and that was because of the richness of the essence of the family and the community from which we came. I remember my grandmother would never let us, when we left Alabama and moved to Cleveland, Ohio, she'd never let us travel back to Cleveland from Alabama without that brown box. Anybody remember that brown box with the wax paper in it and the chicken, the fried chicken? <laughs> okay, y'all do yeah. <laughs> fried chicken, pound cake. I don't remember the other stuff because it was probably vegetables and I didn't eat that. But you know, the whole reason for that was because she didn't want us to have to stop and go around the back of the restaurant, which is the only place where we could be served. Now, we did have to go to the service station and go to the bathroom around the back. That was a necessity. But that brown box took us all the way home. And she would always tell me, you know, you get something up there and nobody can take it from you. I came from a tradition also of women who in the South were school teachers. My cousins, because my mother came from a family of 11 brothers and sisters, and so I think I have about 45 cousins or so, <laughs> first cousins. My cousins would walk the dirt road to school. And on rainy days, of course, they would be passed by a bus which would splatter mud all over them. But when they got to school, they got there to the warm embrace of other cousins who were their teachers, who pumped into them faith and confidence and self-determination and let them know that the limit to their lives and their ambition was only their dreams. And so dreams it was that led me throughout my life as a child back or here, I should say, to Minnesota, where I came to attend Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, met some of the best friends of my life, who are still lifelong friends. Again, I didn't know, coming from the ghetto, the, the Hoff ghetto in Cleveland, Ohio, coming from some of the worst schools, likely, in the United States, that I would have the opportunity to be here in Minnesota to attend one of the best schools in the United States and then to remain here in Minnesota and to be here with you now as a county commissioner. You know, it really isn't about me, it's about the love and embrace of those families, those family members, and it is about the love and embrace of community members here, even in Minnesota. I came through a business career you know, with the IBM Corporation where I stayed for some 17 years but I actually found that the joy of my life was mentoring young people. And so after realizing they weren't going to pay me full time to bring all the young people from St. Paul Schools where I lived into IBM, I decided to pave my way in the community. Through that community work, I became a school board member and I discovered that the best way to help young people would be to help them move upstream toward better opportunities to be safe in the community, toward better opportunities to learn, toward better opportunities to grow. And that led me to this work at the county because you all do that work. I am so thankful to be here. I can't talk for a long time, but I just want to share with you that it is my goal to share with young women, young black women, young women of color, all women, and with boys and men that your limit is only the limit of your dreams. And that is the work that I want to do here in Ramsey County and I'm so thankful for all of you allowing me to join you in that work. Of course he's going to make me follow Commissioner Turner. <laughs> Words are amazing. These stories are amazing. To be here, this is a highlight probably for this year. To be here on this panel with these amazing women and to be in front of you who so many of you are supportive and I know so many of you because I've worked here for 
quite a long time. It's, it's fantastic. And the threads that go between us are um, amazing and sometimes just happening at different times. I'm fortunate to um, have experiences um, where I've had people invest in me. Um, and that's been huge. I grew up in a community, a smaller city in Iowa, a predominantly white community. I was adopted into a, a multicultural family. Um, that was different in my, in my world and in my space. And I learned very quickly as a small child that there were people who didn't want to invest in me and that expected me to fail. So I quickly grabbed on to people who saw potential in me. And that was really important. And it was people like my parents. It was, um, I ha figure skating was a big part of my life. Um, it was a coach. It was a band teacher. I don't know how many band nerds are in the house, but woo woo, band nerds. Um, it was my grandmother. My grandmother came here as a small child from Mexico. And she had an abusive parent who she had to deal with. And then she went around and she, um, she invested in her siblings and she helped to raise 15 of them. That is huge. And what she could give me out of that space is amazing. And, that, and that's, those investments are what have helped me um, understand what leadership is and what true leadership is. Um, I also just over the years have naturally, naturally gravitated toward leadership. I love it. I love being in spaces where I can help others and take what I've learned throughout the, throughout the years and invest in other people. In college, there were a couple reasons for this. I became a, a community advisor. It's like an RA. You know, you're in charge of your dorm or whatever. And I was excited for the leadership opportunities. My dad was like, but are they paying you for your food and, and room and board? And it's just like, clearly that's what this is about for him. For me, I got a lot more out of it. It was, it was, it was really important. Um, but that's a theme for me, and I'll talk about it if we get to the next question, is about that investment and how people along the way have invested in us and how we can take that in turn and invest in others. Thank you, Kathy. Last but not least, Ms. Maria. What are your most important experiences that have helped prepare you for your leadership role? Well, I took a little bit more of a historical perspective because it is Black History Month. And um, in terms of uh, looking at African Americans over the years, um, the opportunities that we created um, for ourselves were through um, community organizations, and I think that would be, um, aside from my parents, who I would definitely um, put up there as um, one of the main, um, most important things um, shaping my, the ability to prepare me for leadership, but I think um, the community support that I received over the years um, is, is definitely one of the things that, um, it historically and for me was an important thing. For example, if you, um, I remember in high school when I wasn't able to get into the um, advanced placement class because they didn't think that, um, that I could do it. And there were no other black members of the advanced placement class. And so as a result, I um, went to the University of Minnesota for those post-secondary options and I took my advanced placement classes there and I became involved in the Black Student Union. And that was the leadership opportunity. I think one of the most important things that um, was mentioned earlier was about being in a place where you can be free. And I think my experience at a historically black college and university at Fisk University was one of those experiences where I could be free. Um, and also, um, sitting right next to me, she mentioned the sorority. That was a place where I could take on leadership roles, chair committees, and really lead in ways that I was not being recognized in my employment um, or in my schooling um, through the University of Minnesota Law School. Um, I was able to create leadership opportunities for myself, and I think that would be um, one of the things that um, prepares you for leadership, is that you don't have to have a title, as Ms. Francois said, you need to have um, the ability to take on a role and make something out of nothing. And I think all of those experiences um, are what have shaped me. Thank you. So very briefly, we have seven amazing women. Not a lot of time, right? <laughs> 
Um, and so my last question, if each of you could just say a few words about, and I think some of you have hinted on this, what you're doing to really develop other women. But the second question is, as a part of this community of women, black women, and given your leadership role, what are you doing or planning to do to advance the personal and professional development of other women? And I think each of you have spoken to that, but if you can briefly just mention, what, what, would, that, what would that be? All right. Well, I kind of talked about it. It's invest, invest, invest. Um, I try to bring honesty, transparency, and care into working relationships that I have with women. Um, it's 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 so important to make sure that um, we're letting people know that their voice matters. Your voice matters, and helping to create a space where people can speak up and be heard, and to be there and to and to help navigate that when that's not happening. You know, there are people in this room who have done that for me, and they've pushed me into situations where I necessarily didn't think I was ready, and Mary, uh, but, <laughs> but, but it worked. It was well. An example of that was uh, the first time I was the interim, 20 days in, I had to do a huge presentation to the board of commissioners, and then I'm going, okay, we're gonna figure out how to do this, and it went well. It went well because of the people around us because of people investing in me to make sure that I'm not going to fail, that there are, there are wonderful humans here and amazing people in this county system who are, are working um, to make sure and to lift all of us up. The other thing is, speak up. When you see something, when you hear something, when, you, um, when you're a part of a conversation that doesn't sound right, that is putting people down, say something, do something. 75% of the people that I have reported to have been men. I found myself in situations where I've done, I think, a pretty good job of respectfully having conversations with those men who are usually superiors to me in the hierarchy, just saying, you know what, I heard this. I don't think that was intentional in what you said about this woman or this person. Is there a way that we can kind of figure this out and work through it. That's huge, and I think people don't want to be doing the wrong thing. So speaking up and investing are two huge things that I think we could be doing. Briefly, let's go back to Dave. You want to mention? Sure, so I think we need to create pipelines. Where are your pipelines? If you don't know where they are, go find them. I believe in mentorship. That means making sure that we train to competency. But I also believe in sponsorship. That means that you make sure other people know about other folks. So I have colleagues here, they're wonderful. And I want to make sure that everybody else knows that they're wonderful. And I want to make sure that I cross-pollinate and that they, I introduce them to other folks. After today, I'm meeting with a student because I want to make sure she knows the lay of the land. I'm also teaching, and I'm teaching a new generation of lawyers on how to be a lawyer. I'm not a fist pounder. I'm fierce. I might kick your ass. <laughs> but I think you, you lead with kindness. I'm in a profession where I want to help others, but in order to help others, I also have to put my mask on first. That means what do I have to do to be okay so that I can help you be okay? And how do I make sure that you're okay? And that means just checking in. How are you doing? How can I help? And I think that goes a long way. Just to check in, we're really human, we're perfectly imperfect, as one of my bosses said. So let's be kind to each other always. Maria, I'm gonna step back down to that end of the table. Briefly, a couple words around what your contribution would be. I came up with ABC. <laughs> I know it's traditionally always be closing, but I like to consider it always be cultivating. And when I mean cultivating, cultivating relationships with women who are less seasoned in your profession. They can be older or younger than you. Cultivating um, relationships with people who are more seasoned than you. One of the things that happens when you cultivate a relationship with a mentee is that you know enough about them that you can feel confident in recommending them for another position. If you're not spending time with people, you can't bring forth the kind of sponsorship that you need to. And I would say that um, also another part of that is always cultivate training opportunities um, for yourself and others. If I see a training that's awesome and I think it's going to expand my mind and expand my opportunities, I'm going to bring my fellow worker with me because I think that um, the more we know, the better we are and we bring each other up. Thank you.
Thank you. I think that it's critical that you always are asking your staff, what do you want to do? Where do you see yourself? Sometimes individuals don't even think that they have the potential to be going that next step. So it's always about having that conversation. Hey, what would you like to do? And then how can we make that happen? I don't think you put it on that person. Well, hey, uh, figure it out. That collaboratively you say, okay, we can make this work. So if they want to take that class, if you know of an opportunity that that would be good for them, say, hey, have you considered this? I know of this. You know, this may be a good opportunity. Maybe you should consider joining this group or taking this course or even joining this um, program. I think that as leaders, we're aware of certain opportunities that we don't always consider for staff or even other colleagues that may be under us, but we always have to be aware of those things and we have to reach out, having conversations and just being more inclusive to others. Thank you. Yeah. I took a fair bit of time. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. No. Okay. No. So I think for for compliance, it's uh, well. There's two areas. There's there's personal and community, right? Uh, new being new to the community, I'm I'm hoping for you know opportunities and and reaching out to see where I can do uh, the most good. Uh, before I left to go overseas, I I uh, was the chair of our planning commission for our city. Um, did a fair bit of work um, locally uh, back in California, my little beach town I came from. Uh, so that is def that definitely gave us me an opportunity, I say us because I'm usually partnering with my husband, um, to work um, in areas of, of mentorship and, and so on. But I think here, like professionally, uh, compliance is in a u unique sort of setup because there's, you know, it's, an, it's a sort of overarching um, uh, controls function that has a view of, of a lot of things at the same time and it's all about transparency and breaking down barriers and removing silos and so on and with that you get to see you know false barriers as well right so um, uh, uh, false um, uh, barriers to opportunity to visibility and, op and, and what people can can and, and should be doing etc and so you have a lot of opportunities to reach out to people and say, well, why not try try this? Or why not, you know, reach over and, and speak to people over here and, and so on. And people get a, a clearer view of the things that are, are possible and that are open to them. Um, on a community basis, I'm sure that I'll, I'll have a lot of recommendations going forward as to what I, what I could uh, get involved in from uh, a lot of places. So I'm, I'm happy for that. Thank you. Commissioner Carter, and briefly, and then Karen, briefly. Thank you. So I think I've already shared that I'm really about creating dreams and helping people to realize that their dreams can come true. You know, engaging non-traditional folks who we don't typically see in this environment, in our work, is so important. So making sure that the pathways for community engagement and youth engagement exist here at Ramsey County. Um, picking someone up in, not picking someone up, but bringing someone <laughs> from the Skyway into my office for a conversation just informally is important to me. You know, taking time and being available is important to me and spending structured time in mentoring programs and arts programs, making certain that the pathways for employment exist for people and being able to show them those pathways. Just being a person in community and always being available to help someone see that next step is critical and important to me. And last but not least, one of my favorite characters, Zora Neale Hurston, references her mother who passed away early in her life. And she says, Mama always told us to jump at the sun. You might not make it to the sun, but if you land on the moon, that ain't so bad either. Thank you, Commissioner. Here. So I've said it before, I've heard almost everybody, if not everybody here say it, mentor, mentor, mentor. It doesn't matter if you're 64 or 44 or 24 or 14, 
I'm 24, by the way. <laughs> um, mentor, reach out a hand, reach out a hand forward, reach out a hand back, bring someone along with you. Create spaces for other people to shine. Create opportunities for other people to lead. Thank you. And just to wrap up, I know we're doing a time check. I want to thank you all for sharing your journeys into leadership and also what you hope to give back to generations to come. The tradition of sharing stories and our experiences as black women is something that has been passed down by many generations as you've heard today. Today I want to pass down another tradition that powerful black women in my own family have shared with me on, a numerous, on numerous occasions. That's giving each other tokens of appreciation while we are here. There's a saying that, bring me flowers while I'm here. Right? Um, so on behalf of myself and the Black History um, Month Planning Committee, I want to present each of you with a bouquet of flowers. Because again, that tradition is to recognize people while they're here. And so we know we have many people that maybe aren't in leadership today, but are guiding the way for Ramsey County and our powerful black women. I'll continue to pass these out as Melinda wraps up. Thank you, thank you. So again, thank you all for sharing your experiences. All right, well let's give one more big round of applause. For the We all, no matter where you sit, no matter what position you're doing, no matter what background you come from or what family you come from, there's powerful moments here of sharing and transparency and vulnerability, and I think we can all relate to that, and I just thank you for being that um, for us today and for showing us the similarities that we share, that we have in our families and our own traditions, so thank you for that. Please make sure that you're, you're checking out the next event of Mapping Prejudice, which is on February 12th, and the compostable bins around the area you can throw your stuff away in. and just thank you to the Black History Month Committee for organizing this. This is awesome. We are really thankful for the work you shared with us today. Before you go everybody, uh, my name is Dave Mott. I'm the city co-chair of this year's Black History Month Committee and I wanted to acknowledge um, since we're on the subject of powerful black women, my county co-chair Misty Williams who could not be here today. Her brother, Earl Stanley Williams, passed over the weekend, and so she was left to attend to that. And I just wanted to mention that, uh, to, to keep her in your thoughts today. Thank you. Myself and George Dobby represent Ramsey County here as co-chair. So we're not giving, we're giving thanks to Misty, but we're her ones that helping her out as well. So if you need to sign up with our committee, Certainly look for me and Joyce because we certainly need more Ramsey County people with our collaboration with the city. Thank you for coming.